start? Okay, then we're live. Oh, sorry, that was the password, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It's a great honor to be at Luger Planet again. Um, so excited. Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing conference. Kudos to the FSF and all the team for putting it together. Uh, I'm going to speak today about uh, free software, as usual. Um, specifically uh, about some security problems that are one more argument for using free software. So, um, got to remember that when a big bad wolf knocks on your door, uh, Spectrum Meltdown are with him. Uh, I want to bring uh, to the conversation some of the wisdom of, of grandmas. Uh, this is paying homage to Grandma Betty, 33, whom I've come across only after she passed away. But I, I found her lovely, and I suppose, as a grandma, she would have shared the usual grandma wisdom. I don't know whether she would actually say any of these, but prevention is better than a cure. That's a very important point that I want to remind you of. Uh, grandma will usually tell you, hey, take... Uh, t uh, take a coat with you because it might get cold or, or well things might get hot so better have protection too that's a very uh, modern grandma maybe but it's the sort of wisdom that is very important otherwise you can get sick and bad things then will happen uh, don't open the door to big bad wolf or don't let him in actually because sometimes well, see, it doesn't matter that the door uh, is closed, <laughs> right? The piggies are uh, at risk there. Uh, do not take candy from strangers. Uh, that's good advice. Uh, it used to be the case that people were taught not to take programs from strangers. Uh, 20 years ago, that was common wisdom. These days, people will run programs from random websites and not even think about that. I think this is knowledge from, a, a wisdom from, from grandma that we should bring back. Now, it used to be a lot easier to separate data from code. Um, there, were, there, was, there were data files with text or stuff like that, and then there were programs that you actually installed on your computer. Uh, containing the active instructions that will interpret uh, the data sometimes and, and, and figure out how to present it to you, or how to let you interact with it. And then someone had this brilliant idea of messing things up. Not. <laughs> um, software embedded in data came up as macros originally, and then suddenly you opened a file that was supposed to be a data file, and it started running stuff on your computer. Uh, lots of viruses and worms and, 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 and <laughs> a general mess ensued. And, but they didn't learn from that. And now you open a random website, and if you have JavaScript disabled, the website will normally tell you, please enable JavaScript, otherwise it will not work. This is nonsense. This is a terrible danger that we're all getting into. This automatic execution is exactly like accepting candy from strangers on your computer. Nowadays, you open a website and uh, you'll get a lot of uh, surveillance trackers running on your computer. You're going to get uh, crypto coin miners running on your computer and consuming your power. And they will even use that to block you from seeing the very website. Uh, say, the Brazilian government decided that it was a good idea for the, the laws of the country to be published in such a way that you can only see them if you run a piece of proprietary JavaScript first. I don't like that. You know, you, you, I hope you understand why I don't like that. But sometimes I feel I'm, 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 I'm the crazy one because I don't like that. Everyone else seems to think it's okay. 
But we are at a time in which some people are waking up to these dangers. Like some governments are uh, banning the use of a proprietary antivirus program because it's made in a country that doesn't share the same values. Uh, some mobile phones are being banned because they're manufactured by a company controlled by a different state. And there's good reason for doing that. Like, uh, one country learned the hard way that running a proprietary operating system controlled by a different state, in a way, is very dangerous. So, some people in decision in positions of authority are figuring out that they shouldn't expose themselves and their, their government to this sort of danger. There are issues of sovereignty, there are issues of jurisdiction, no, controlling the technology. It's just not the, the bits. It's, there, there is a jurisdiction involved. So governments are beginning to figure that out. Some of them, anyway. Armed forces, election systems that use computing have to be particularly careful about that. But somehow, the same governments, they're figuring out that they shouldn't use technology that is controlled by different states, are okay with subjecting their citizens to running programs that are not okay. So uh, I feel a bit like I don't know whether you're familiar with this uh, this the writing of Machado de Assis. That's a Brazilian writer from uh, the 1860s or so. He wrote this story in which a psychiatrist uh, starts finding that everyone around him is crazy and and gets them to to treatment, and suddenly he realizes that hey, you know what? It looks like being a little crazy is normal. So I'm the crazy one for finding all these people crazy, and, and then he leaves them all out and, and interns himself. I sometimes feel like that. But I don't think I'm crazy for thinking the way I do. I, I still think that the others who don't need... Uh, uh, reality shock, so to speak. So why is that? Because Spectrum meltdown and a number of security problems came up that have to do with uh, using side channels to, to leak information that shouldn't be leaked to different processes running on the same computer. So consider these uh, instructions here, like compare two numbers, and if one is less than the other, then you read from a memory position given by X, and then you take one of the bits from, from the red value, and then you access a memory chunk uh, depending on how th that bit is, on whether that bit is zero or one. Well, see, uh, it's not that simple, really, because the, the it will, it will often be the case that maybe one of these values in mem is in memory and it will take a while for it to be loaded from memory. The CPU would just sit idle. So what, what they figure out they would do when designing CPUs is to speculate. Let's assume that the result of the test is this and then go ahead with it. If it turns out to be true, then okay, we, we gain time running other computations, speculatively. Otherwise, well, just undo the stuff that we speculated, and it will be all right in the end. So let's assume that n is in memory, and it, it takes a while to fetch that value from memory. So there enters branch prediction. Uh, the, 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 the processor will look at the test and see, hey, I've been here a million times before, and nearly 99% of those times, x was actually less than n. So I will assume that this time it is also. And so it goes ahead executing the conditional instructions. Now, 
It turns out that this time, x is not less than n, but the processor doesn't know that yet. But it still goes ahead and accesses a memory position indexed by, by x. That turns out that this time there's an attacker that managed to choose the value for x so that the position of memory that is to be accessed is part of the kernel memory and it holds a security key that are not supposed to be able to access. The computer, the processor, will do that anyway. And eventually, if n turns out to be greater than x, or not greater than x, then it will uh, reverse that and, and, and not, not do anything. But since we were speculating, it goes ahead and it reads that piece of memory, and it takes a note that, oh, I have to check that the access is permitted before I actually commit to this execution. Turns out that then it extracts a bit from this value, and then it, it references a, piece, a chunk of memory with that zero or one. And then it, it gets the value of n, and says, oh, I shouldn't have done any of this. And then it undoes the entire computation, except that it had already started bringing the chunk of memory, zero or one, into the internal caches. Then some separ separate piece of code can measure how fast each of these chunks of memory can be accessed and then tell whether that piece of memory that shouldn't have been read in the first place was a zero or a one. So you leak information that was protected. You get to it using this side channel. This brings a lot of information to hands that shouldn't be able to get to them. So um, even with virtual memory that is supposed to separate uh, who can access each piece of memory. Even with virtu within virtual machines, one program running within a virtual machine can't actually get to the host system with variants of these attacks. In browsers running JavaScript, it is possible to look at the credit, cards num credit card numbers that are stored in your uh, browser. That's Terrifying, isn't it? Well, of course, why should you worry? Well, you probably have personal data on your computer. And when memory barriers come down, they become exposed to what exactly? Let's think about that. So, what software do you use? Is it Reliable, that's not really the word I'm looking for. I, I, I want it trustworthy. Is software that you run something that you can really trust? I mean, does it actually serve you? Is it under your control? Does it do what you want? Can you audit its source code to tell what it really does? More than that, have you actually audited it? Or someone that you trust? has audited it for you? If this is all true, if you have actually made sure that all of the software running on your computer does what you want of it, well, then it's all free software. Then, if, if this is the case, if all of the programs running on your computer serve you, what is the problem if one of them can read information from the other? They're doing just what you want, right? You could have modified them so that they pass the information in some more efficient way, but you don't have to do that. You can leave them as they are. It's okay if the programs serve you. But if they don't serve you, well, then it should worry. 
Of course, programs that serve you are free software. But it's the very definition of free software, a program that is under your control. Because it respects the essential freedoms. You can run the software for any purpose. You can study the source code. That means you can audit it or have someone that you trust audit it for you. You can adapt. If you find that the program doesn't do what you want, or if you find that it does something that you don't want it to do, then you can adapt it so that it does what you wish. And these are uh, freedoms that empower you individually. But there's so much software that no one can audit and care for all of the software they use. So we have to rely on the community. And that's why the other two freedoms are also essential. We need to be able to share the software so that we can ask help and get help from each other in, in maintaining and auditing the software so as to verify that it does what we wish and improve it so that it actually does that. And then we get software freedom. If all the programs that we use are software freedom, then we are free. Uh, are free software, then we are free. Now, it used to be the case that we promoted free software on the grounds that it is a human right. Well, it's, it's still the case. We still do that. But now you have one more reason to choose to use exclusively free software, and that is the security of your data. So what do, you need, what do you need in your computer? You need the operating system to be free. You need all the applications to be free. That's not enough. You need all of the libraries that they use to be free. You need the plugins. You need the add-ons, or however you name them to be free. Any piece of software could actually be collecting and leaking information using these attacks that I'm talking about. So even software embedded in the data has to be free for you to audit and to actually verify what it does. Drivers have to be free. Firmware has to be free. That's why I maintain Linux library. Microcode has to be free, because it also controls the behavior of your computer. All of these programs running on your computer need to be free. Otherwise, they could be collecting and leaking your information. Anything that is not free is fake news. <laughs> It might as well have been a wolf. Now, didn't get me started and serve as a software substitute. That's giving up without a fight. That's delivering all your data to the provider without even the struggle to keep any control over it. Don't do that. Now, is there any way I can still use this? Clown computing thing? Well, you know, <laughs> as we put it, the cloud is just someone else's computer. So uh, think very seriously and very hard about whether you really want to place your computing in someone else's hands. But OK, let's, let's compare. You have a computer here or sitting right here, and it's under your control. Uh, and, well, to some extent, if it's a new enough computer, it will have Intel Me inside, it will, or AMD PSP, and those are backdoors that we'd better avoid. So these computers are better. But, well, let's say you chose one of these uh, computers, and, but instead of keeping it on, on, on site, you now hire some provider to, to run the computer for you. But it's your computer. You're installing the software remotely. You're running remote. That's fine. If you can trust that the, the, the provider will not mess with it, it's OK. Now, how about virtual machines? 
What if, what if the provider offers to, to, to maintain the illusion that you have a machine of your own, but there are multiple tenants sharing the same hardware? Well, that could still be okay. If you can share that the provider is really keeping at isolation, there is no ethical problem, no ethical dilemma involved. They're not harming you if they keep to the promise. If they keep their promise that you are as if on your own computer, that's okay. Now, in practice, Spectrum Meltdown made, made big trouble for them because suddenly it becomes impossible to ensure that one customer cannot spy on the other. So the only way to actually deliver on the promise is to use separate computers. So can you trust that? Well, I don't know. It's not up to me to decide who you trust. If, if your provider is serious, they'll probably give you a separate computer at this point because they can't possibly be serious about maintaining isolation with what we know about these security problems. Now, some people listen to this speech and, and think, oh, if, if, if I just run free software, I'll be safe. No, that's not what I'm saying. Freedom is not enough for security, it's a requirement. You actually have to work hard to audit everything and make sure that you can trust the software that you run. But if you don't have freedom, then you're already lost. If the software is not free, that means you don't have control over it. It means someone else does. Someone else controls the computer, uh, the, the, the software, and through the software controls you. So that's not good. With software freedom, we, what we can get is uh, defenses. We, we don't get a silver bullet. This is not Hollywood. What we get is means to defend ourselves, individually and collectively. When it comes to these attacks, they're sufficiently elaborate that if someone tried to sneak in an implementation of these attacks, not just the, the bit that I showed you, but the, the, the other bit that times accesses to memory and figures out what the bits are. Those are sufficiently elaborate and specific that a patch that tried to add that to any random program would probably be caught on review. Probably. No assurance, but probably. Now, there are plenty of problems, security problems even, in, in, in various programs. Nothing changed. Again, no silver bullet. It's true, though, that some of the defenses that fell with Spectrum Meltdown remain functional when it comes to accidental bugs. If, if there is a random access to some piece of memory that is protected, you will still get an exception raised, and that will prevent the accidental access to that memory. And then there are many variants are, of these attacks that have been published since January last year. And all but one of them have shown to be uh, vulnerable. The attacks are vulnerable to user freedom. So if you only use free software and actually audit it, you probably are not vulnerable to these attacks. But except for this one, NetSpectre, that is remotely exploitable. You, 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 if you have a piece of software that is vulnerable running on your computer, then someone else's computer nearby can trigger 
that code and make that code run, they could actually get to memory on your computer. So what are you going to do? Oh, the software freedom thing is useless. Well, no, it turns out it's not. Because without software freedom, you would be unable to, to audit the programs and look for the gadgets that are exploitable. And once you find them, you couldn't fix them. So with software freedom, you can do that independently, even if your government would rather you remain vulnerable. So that's how important this is. It's actually, it, it, the software freedom is, remains very valuable. Although, as I said, it's no silver bullet. I want to talk to you a little about the execution web. Uh, the, the, the term is a little dramatic, maybe, but <laughs> um, web pages now carry a lot of uh, attack vectors like Flash and Java and JavaScript, and most of that code is not free software. Well, sometimes it is for the, one, the, the person supplying the code to your browser, but not to you. Again, you're running, you're eating strangers' candies if you just go about running any piece of software that is delivered to you over HTTP or HTTPS even. What can you do to defend yourself? I recommend GNU LibreJS. It's a great tool. It's a great, uh, it's a plugin for IceCat. It's built into IceCat actually. Make sure it's enabled. Um, NoScript is also useful, uh, and GreaseMonkey is, is also useful. I'll, I'm, I'm going to talk a little about each of them. So uh, LibreJS allows you, uh, it, it, when you access a website that tries to get JavaScript to run on your computer, it will let you know about each piece of JavaScript, and it will, it will offer you the opportunity to, to audit that piece of JavaScript before you decide whether or not to let it run. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Thanks to the LibreJS developers for that. Uh, NoScript will block all of the scripts. So the thing about LibreJS, I misspoke a moment ago. LibreJS will look for license tags in, in, in the JavaScript, and by default, it will allow software to run if it's marked as free software. If the license tag says, this is under the GPL, or this is under the Apache license, or 2.0, or any free software license, LibreJS will let it run. Well, maybe you don't want that, maybe even if it's free software. Because you want to audit it first if you're paying attention to my recommendation. So NoScript helps with that. It will block everything by default. And then you can decide on, 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 on a basis of provider, uh, on the source of the JavaScript. I want to run these. I don't want to run these others. I, I use both. They're both useful. Uh, they, they both uh, g get me some defenses. And LibreJS actually helps to, to, to audit each piece of JavaScript. So I like both. GreaseMonkey allows you to customize web pages before they're displayed for you. So you can uh, you, you download uh, the web page and it, it says, oh, I want you to fetch and run these scripts from this site and this other site and this other site. And there are like a thousand different uh, websites, uh, oh, sorry, uh, pieces of JavaScript in the typical web page these days. Um, GreaseMonkey enables you to customize that. So you can look at this. These, these JavaScript here, uh, I, I want to tweak that a little bit. I want to adapt this program so that it does what I wish. Or, or instead of this piece of, this version of jQuery that the, the website uses, 
I want to use this version that I customize myself. So you can do that stuff with Grease Monkey. But it's hard. I don't really know how to do that myself. I know there are people who do that. There are website ninjas. But it's possible to do. Now, what, what would I like to be able to do? I would like this to be easy for regular users to use. I wish we lived in a world in which the server does not decide what software runs on my computer. I do. And if I want to modify the, that software, I have easy control over that, even if it's on the web. So we need better software for that. It's already possible, but there's a lot to be improved. So if you're looking for opportunities to contribute and you know a little JavaScript, there's a project for you. Um, but if the user does not have control, if the user cannot customize, then it's not free software, even if the license says it could be. Then it should be blocked. It shouldn't run. You shouldn't run on your computer software that you cannot control, because otherwise very bad things could happen. And this is no longer an exaggeration. So I, show, I wrote a paper about these ideas, and I showed them to a colleague that was actually involved to, to his neck, if not deeper, on the mitigations for the first round and then the second round and the third round and, and so on of Spectre meltdown uh, security problems. He's an open source guy, not a free software guy. He responded, this is nonsense. The moment you access a web page, you're lost. I said, yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. You shouldn't be running code on your computer that you cannot control. It's nonsense to do that. We have to go back to grandma's advice. Don't take candy from strangers. Don't let Big Bad Wolf in. Now, what does the industry want you to do? Oh, take this proprietary microcode uh, and install it on your computer. And then the kernel will be able to use the feature that we added, and it will mitigate some of the problems. Have you ever heard of proprietary software upgrade bringing undesirable features? Anyone? Maybe? <laughs> yeah. So could these microcode updates possibly bring any undesirable features? Anyone want to read one more line and guess? <laughs> yeah, they will make your computer incredibly slower. Why? Why should you be willing to tolerate that abuse? Why don't you just say no? Hey, look, I got this computer. It's fast enough for me. I don't want to buy the next generation from you. You're screwing with me. I'll keep on using this computer. Yeah, it has proprietary microcode. That's the, the devil I know. I'll stick with it for now. I'll keep it fast. I'll run only free software anyway. Why should I be worried? Why should I incur this penalty? Oh, but look, security. You've got to deal with security. Yeah, right. So, OK, let's assume, for the sake of the argument, that I actually install these microcode updates. and I, I, I start using 30% more power to run the same programs. Am I safe? Well. 
Just last week, there was yet another variant. Actually, no, it's not a variant. It's a different line of attack. There's no fix for a scene for this one. What now? What are you going to do? Remember grandma. <laughs> so you don't know what other holes they, they already know about that we don't. So don't expose yourself to the risk in the first place. The, these ideas have resisted several generations of spectrum meltdown attacks and a lot more. I haven't had to worry about this. My only concern has been, OK, the argument stands. Now, my wife recently mentioned that running the stuff from, from the internet that you can't even audit is a little like driving while blindfolded. And people don't realize the gravity of it. So, um, I mean, just don't let Big Bad Wolf in. It's, it's, it's the only way to, to stand a chance of being safe. Once you let the wolf in, there, it's really hard to contain it. So don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. And then when you're safe inside your safe home, Big Bad Wolf could be outside blowing, but it will only be blowing the risks away. You won't have to worry. The only thing you'll have to fear is, <laughs> I used to joke in Brazil, Temer himself, because Temer in Portuguese means fear, and that was our former president. <laughs> so we're only getting worse, you see. But for freedom, we're getting better. So. Thank you so much. I think we have time for questions, right? Oh, thank you. Should I ask you questions? I think um, no scripts uh, has a default whitelist of um, 10 or 20 sites. So uh, I was just Good wondering point. if you're aware and maybe to warn people to clear that list out before they uh, use it. That's a very good suggestion. LibreJS will, will, I mean, using both is safer. But, but yeah, if you're only using one of them, make sure you know what it's whitelisting to begin with. Um, yeah, one, don't uh, most modern CPUs already come with microcode in, even out of the box? So how oh, do yeah. we deal with that? Yeah, that's the devil we sort of no. So yeah, it's, it's a problem. I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's a good thing. They're hardware originally. Then if you have a BIOS, in the BIOS that is non-free, that it might be overriding the, the original hardware uh, microcode. And if you have an operating system or normally the kernel that can override that it can that can happen again if it's non free but there you go uh, we're, we we are working on free CPUs we don't really have a lot of those these days yeah risk 5 comes to mind absolutely thank you uh, so this is uh, a comment uh, for the last person's question. Um, 
So the, uh, a few years ago, IBM opened everything above the hardware level in the Power9 architecture. Uh, so that, that is now from microcode up, uh, including the BIOS, the board management controller, all Libre, like totally free software. Um, there, are, there are limitations to it. Uh, it's very expensive. It's very power hungry. It's meant for corporate applications and not for like individual people who want their computer freedom. Um, but there is uh, one company that's selling a whiteboard motherboard, uh, or a uh, white label motherboard uh, that works with this architecture. And it is right now the only sort of high performance contemporary option available to individuals concerned about software freedom. Uh, yeah, we have options in various different layers, right, that are, that are popping up. And this is a great thing. We're not quite there yet, I think. For, for regular users, I mean, real people like us, the, the only option available at this point is really old computers. <laughs> no? More questions? Well, I'll be happy to answer it. Thank you.